First of all, who is, sorry, what is transition? Then who is transitioning? Um, what are the health outcomes after transition? So what's the evidence for health outcomes? Um, what, what is the evidence for um, transition interventions at work? And then what do we need to know? So firstly, what is transition? Um, so this definition is often quoted, the purposeful planned movement of children with special health care needs from child to adult centred care. Um, and the word transition on the face of it um, may be thought more to be relevant to perinatal HIV in um, high resource settings um, where children are seen in paediatric care and then when they grow up they move, they transition to adult or adolescent care. Um, for adolescents with um, horizontal HIV, where they're seen really depends on the country or the region. So um, some may be seen in adult care and therefore just avoid the whole transition issue completely. Others may go to um, paediatric or adolescent care and then transition comes into play. But in, in many low resource settings, for example, South Africa, uh, most adults and children are seen together in primary care clinics, um, nurse-led clinics, and Marianne will speak more about this. But certainly in these settings, although there may not actually be any transfer in the clinical care um, where someone receives their care, um, transition may have a broader relevance. So we're talking about changes and milestones in adolescents' lives as they um, transition into adulthood. So increased independence from parents, um, leaving school, um, starting work, perhaps leaving home. Um, and we have some policy documents now on how to do transitions. So the top one here is the American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement on transitioning HIV infected youth. And then this, the, the lower one is um, guidelines from the UK, from NICE. And this is guidelines for transitioning children to adult care um, in, uh, across um, chronic diseases. And these guidance, guidelines are important because um, the whole area of adolescent health and transition is relatively new in high resource and low resource settings. And whether we're thinking about the paediatric to adult care model or transition in a broader sense of transitioning into adulthood, um, one of the key themes about transition is leading an independent life and increased personal autonomy. Um, so taking responsibility for one's own um, health, for one's clinic appointments, uh, for taking their ART, um, and less parental influence. And this, of course, depends on being aware of one's own diagnosis. And this is complicated with the stigma of HIV and also the family nature of perinatal HIV. Um, and so in the UK, we are now um, recommending that children with HIV um, are disclosed to about their status in primary school years, ideally by the age of nine. And WHO um, uh, guidelines support this. So who is transitioning? Um, so these are UNAIDS 2015 HIV data um, globally. This is for um, adolescents with perinatal HIV and horizontal HIV. And so the, you can see that the estimated number of 10 to 19 year olds living with HIV was just under 2 million globally. Then there were 250,000 new infections in 15 to 19 year olds. And then about 40,000 10 to 19 year olds um, dying in, uh, from AIDS related causes in 2015. And the last column on the slide, you can see that the majority of these adolescents are living and dying in sub-Saharan Africa. And we know from the WHO that um, AIDS and HIV is now the second leading cause of death in adolescents. And also we know that adolescents are the only group in which um, AIDS deaths are increasing. But we don't really know the drivers for this. Um, certainly a um, Amy Slowgrove is going to speak after Ma Marianne about some of the characteristics of, of, of these adolescents um, globally. And then this is also UNAIDS data but for 2014, um, showing where, the, where adolescents live, um, and the majority are living in, um, in resource-poor um, countries. But interestingly, um, around half of adolescents are living in just six countries. So South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, India, Mozambique, and Tanzania, giving us a very clear idea of where we might wish to focus our interventions. So zoning in on high resource settings, um, we did some work a couple of years ago to work out the number of um, children and young people with perinatal HIV in Europe. And this was children and young people in our Eurocord cohort collaboration, which is like an idea collaboration for Europe. And um, we did this work because we were concerned that the European surveillance estimates were far too low. 
And we found that there were around 12,000 children and young people in our HIV cohort studies in Europe with perinatal HIV. So to gather quite a large number for Europe, obviously not globally, but, but, but not insubstantial. And all of these children and young, young people have got opportunities for follow-up because they're all enrolled in our cohort studies. Um, clearly, there'll be a lot more children and young people um, who are not included in this figure who are not in cohorts. And then... Moving on to the UK specifically, um, this graph shows data from um, my own cohort, the CHIPS cohort, which is a national cohort of um, children and young people with HIV in the UK and Ireland. And the graph shows the, um, the age at last follow-up of the cohort. So if you look on the x-axis, you can see the year of last follow-up, and underneath that is a denominator each year. And then the, um, the different um, colours show the different age bands. So just to, um, just to orientate you to what's going on here, if you look at the blue and the purple um, parts of the, um, the bars, you can see that the proportion of um, children and young people who are aged 15 and above in the last few years has increased substantially. And what we found is that a third of our cohort have already transitioned to adult care. Um, a third are transitioning now and in the next five years. Um, and as in many high-resource settings, um, many of these young people presented to care 10 to 15 years ago, so they are older with very different treatment histories to many children in low-resource settings. So what are the health outcomes after transition? Well, we first thought about just focusing on the transition outcomes, primarily retention and adherence, but the key thing to say here really is that there are very limited data out there on outcomes after transition, despite us having all of those children and young people in cohort studies. Um, this is partly because a lot of the paediatric cohort studies were designed a long time ago when we didn't expect children to survive into adulthood. And so they were set up on their own rather than being embedded into adult cohort studies. And one challenge is now data linkage, and I'll come back to that. Um, because there's so little evidence on outcomes after transition, I'd also like to mention um, adolescent health outcomes more broadly, and there's been more work on this and a growing body of evidence led by some researchers in the US, which has looked at um, wider aspects of adolescent health, health outcomes, both in um, adolescents with HIV and adolescents without HIV, to try to disentangle how much added morbidity is um, associated with having HIV. And so for these health outcomes more broadly, I'll um, highlight some of the posters from this um, conference that are, are, are looking at this issue. So this is a um, transition cascade of care um, from some researchers in Baltimore, um, and they took 50 adolescents in paediatric care and looked at what happened to them when they transitioned to um, adult care. And so the dark grey is a behaviourally um, acquired um, adolescence. There were 31 of those, and then there were 19 adolescents with perinatal HIV. And their end point was retention in adult care, and they found that about 85% were successfully linked to care, um, shown here in the red box. Interestingly, this is a population which um, trans transitions to adult care at a later age, so around 22 years to 25 years in this study, which I believe is related more to insurance issues rather than maturity or readiness to transition. Um, but only 50% were retained in adult care at 12 months. And then this is a study, um, this is a poster at the workshop, um, this is by our group in the UK, and we were looking specifically at the effect of um, transition to adult care on CD4 after transition in a context where we see paediatric um, children are seen in paediatric care and then go on to adult care. And in this study we linked two data sets, so our um, our national paediatric cohort were linked with an adult cohort, which covers around a third of adults um, receiving HIV treatment in the UK. And um, we found that 271 adults were, with perinatal HIV were in both data sets. So the median follow-up in paediatric care was 12 years, and the median follow-up in adult care um, was three years. And in an analysis, we modelled CD4 pre- and post-transfer, and we focused on CD4 because we thought it might give us a better idea of how these young people were doing long-term than viral load would. And after we adjusted for everything else, CD4 was stable pre-transfer, but then it declined after transfer, and that's after adjustment for all the other variables we had. Um, and also CD4 was generally worse for girls um, compared to boys, 
And when we looked at whether there was an effect of changing hospital as well as going from paediatric to adult care, we found that this didn't in any way affect the trend in CD4. So why aren't there more studies measuring health outcomes after transition? Um, well, there are several issues which complicate matters. Firstly, problems with measuring when transition occurred. It's often a process, it's not a defined time point. In our study on the previous slide, we used the last visit date in paediatric care. We could equally have used the first visit date in adult care. Um, people have used different outcomes, so we use CD4, so most of the people have used retention or viral load, so we're complicating things. Um, and um, there have been so far really small sample sizes which have not been able to adjust for confounding. Um, studies often don't describe in any detail the background context in which um, the research is taking place, so what kinds of interventions are offered and when. Um, and studies often don't have comparison groups. And these could be people transitioning in earlier calendar years, or they could be people with other routes of, of infection transitioning to adult care. And there's definitely been a focus on short-term rather than long-term outcomes. And so we don't really know what the long-term health outcomes are. And just to give you an idea of some of the problems with measuring long-term long outcomes, this is a map that you saw earlier of our children and young people across Europe. But this time, the colours indicate whether the, the cohorts are, are unified paediatric adult cohorts or whether there's possibilities for data linkage between paediatric and adult cohorts. And so theoretically, although we have 12,000 young children and young people across Europe with perinatal HIV, few are in countries where actually the data sets, paediatric and adult data sets, are held together. So Sweden, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Romania and Greece. And although some of the countries here, it, data linkage is, is possible or it's in progress, it's quite a lengthy process and it also has its own complications. So here are some of the abstracts from the workshop which don't specifically address transition but which dig a bit deeper into some of the health problems issue and issues facing adolescents in high resource settings. So Sarah Bernays and co colleagues are presenting finds from a findings from a qualitative study of young people which was linked to the breather trial of weekends off therapy and she found some very interesting findings of young people um, telling the researchers that they missed um, doses um, which they found it very difficult to articulate to their clinician in clinic visits um, because they had continually suppressed viral load. Then Claude Mellins and colleagues are presenting a study of young people with perinatal HIV and an HIV negative control group from New York from the CASA cohort and they looked at the proportion reaching various milestones. Um, their median age was 22 years. And interestingly, they found no difference between the positive group and the negative group in terms of um, it, some of the milestones. So for example, nearly 80% in each of the groups had graduated from high school. Then there are two posters from our UK ALFI cohort. This is another cohort of um, perinatally infected young people and negative sibling controls. Um, their age is around 17 years. And in one of the posters, which is looking at um, adherence, we found that over one in four young adults um, reported missing doses in the last three days. And interestingly, as they were 17 years old, um, three quarters were still relying on family members to remind them to take their ART. And then in our other poster, we found that there was a similar um, prevalence of um, having ever had sex in young adults with and without HIV. Um, this is different to other settings and just contrasts the different populations um, across the globe. And then finally, a study from FACTS and IMPACT on pregnancy outcomes. And they found that infants of women with perinatal HIV may be at higher risk of lower birth weight than infants um, uh, born to HIV positive women with other um, routes of, of, of transmission. So what transition interventions work? Um, this is a statement from the new WHO guidelines and for the first time now they have a section on delivering HIV services to adolescents. And so they say adolescent friendly health services should be implemented in, high, in HIV services to ensure engagement and improved outcomes. Strong recommendation, low quality evidence. And um, we can broadly um, categorise um, uh, uh, interventions as either being focusing on retention in care or in adherence. And there are very, very few studies on this, um, similarly to the studies or very little evidence on adolescent health outcomes. But I'm going to um, illustrate this using two studies, one that has looked at retention in care and one looking at adherence. <coughs> 
So this is a study by Lana Lee and colleagues in the US HIV network, and they looked at 680 15 to 24-year-olds um, who were in adult and pediatric care in 15 clinics across their network. And what they did was look at retention in care um, in one year, in 2011. And in an analysis, um, they looked at what service um, level interventions affected retention as well as individual level retentions. And so this is just an extract from their paper, and this just shows the um, services um, that may be associated with improved retention. And this column here is the adjusted odds ratio. So what they found was that youth-friendly waiting areas, evening clinic hours, and providers with adolescent training were all associated with better retention in care over a 12-month period. So youth-friendly services really impacting on retention. And these findings are quite novel, and, um, and we need more studies like this. And then the second paper is about um, adherence, and this is work from Caroline Foster and colleagues in London. And she did a very small pilot study just on 11 young people with perinatal HIV who all had extremely poor history of adherence. Um, and what she did was offer financial payments and motivational interviewing, which was conditional on improved viral load. And so in the box, you can see what the, what the young people got if they managed to meet various targets. And so if they remained suppressed for 12 months, um, then they, they were offered vouchers to a value of 200 pounds. This was dependent on having a consistently suppressed viral load and turning up for motivational interviewing. And essentially their findings were that this package improved virological and immunological outcomes with fairly minimal expenditure. And financial incentives have been used in other disease areas and certainly there's interest in looking at cash transfers in adolescents with and without HIV in uh, resource-limited settings. One of the key things that is often missed um, in these studies is engagement with young people themselves and asking them what they think helped them stay in, in, in care. And some researchers from Norway and Denmark did a nice synthesis of 18 qualitative studies on transition. This covered interviews with 368 young people across a variety of chronic um, in diseases, um, including HIV, and there were some common themes across these diseases. So firstly, facing changes in significant relationships. So here this was about letting go of the familiarity of paediatric care without really knowing what the future might bring in adult care. There was moving from a familiar to an unknown ward culture, so adapting to the cultural differences between paediatric and adult care environments. Being prepared for transition, so being ready for transfer rather than being forced to go over at a certain age. And then achieving responsibility, so taking responsibility for one's own health and meeting the expectations that come with this. And I think you can see that although these themes came from a variety of chronic infections, chronic diseases, um, they do resonate for um, HIV um, and adolescents. More specifically for HIV, the Children's HIV Association in the UK has been doing a lot of youth engagement work, as have many NGOs across the world. But I thought that this was quite a nice transition example of, of youth engagement. And so they asked young people um, how adult clinics differed and then also how clinics can support transition. And so in terms of how adult clinics differed, um, the young people said, well, it's quite good because there are more people your age not so good that it can feel uncomfortable and awkward. And also doctors rely on you to look after yourself. So really they're getting that autonomy um, perspective. And then also in terms of how clinics can support transition, they said people should be asked first if they're ready to move on to an, a, an adult clinic and transferring to an adult clinic with a friend where possible can be helpful. These are only a selection of quotes from the research that was done, but it, you can see how it might help us try to design interventions for young people that might work. So often people say, well, if we haven't got any evidence in, um, in HIV, what do we know about transition from other chronic diseases? And unfortunately and surprisingly, similarly, there's very little out there. So this is a recent Cochrane review of transition of care services for adolescents across chronic diseases. And they found that they only four um, trials um, across the globe in, in um, chronic disease transition research, they were all small and none were in HIV. And they concluded that the overall certainty of this evidence is low. Um, similarly, they found nine relevant reviews of um, adolescent transition. Um, these included observational studies as well as trials. And similarly, all highlighted the lack of rigorously evaluated interventions. <coughs> 
So why is there so little um, evidence for interventions? Well, there's problems with designing interventions. What is the standard of care? That's a big question. A lot, a lot of the time, these interventions are tailored at individual um, patients. There are small numbers of patients for many conditions, making um, trials unfeasible. And there are problems with transferability and generalizability of findings from one group of adolescents to another and between countries and regions. Also, transition is a relatively new concept, so there isn't that much historical research. But it's clear that much of the evidence is likely to come from um, observational studies. So what do we need to know? Well, starting with quantitative studies and moving clockwise around this slide from the light blue speech bubble, we clearly need longer term clinical outcomes. We know a tiny bit about what happens immediately after transition and perhaps 12 months after transition, but we need to know what happens at two years, three years, five years post transition. We also need to know who has better outcomes and who has worse outcomes and what that can tell us about where to target our interventions. I think we could look more at how we assess readiness to transition and if it influences outcomes. And then we need to look at the broader outcomes of these adolescents beyond HIV. So are they meeting their employment milestones, education milestones? And then service delivery. What actually are the different models of care being offered around the world? And what aspects of this care are effective? Um, is it peer support that's effective? Um, is there any disclosure training going on that's very good? What about training of staff members? And then also, which populations work for these interventions? So interventions for MSM may be very different to adolescents with perinatal HIV. And we need several different approaches and a toolbox, really, which we can implement in different settings. And then finally, um, some what we need from ec in terms of economic and qualitative studies and advocacy. Firstly, economic studies in blue. There have been very, there will, I don't think there's been any cost effectiveness research um, looking at specific interventions in the transition period. Um, clearly, some of the transition interventions can cost a lot more, but then that would be okay if they lead to better outcomes. Then in red, um, qualitative, we've got a lot to learn from patient experiences. We don't really know what helps them stay in care after transition. We also don't know anything about those who were not retained in care and go back into care and what helps them go back into care. Um, we also don't know what kind of IRT they would prefer, for example, long-acting injectables and the, like, the likely popularity of that. And I'm sure we've got a lot to learn from family members and clinic staff. And then, very importantly, advocacy, so engaging with young people during our research studies to make sure we're asking the right questions, to make sure we're interviewing the right people, to make sure we're, in, we're interpreting the findings in the right way. And also, adolescents are really extremely good at disseminating findings and much better in my experience than I am. Um, so that's all from me. So over to Mary Ann. I'd just like to thank Mary Ann and Annette for their um, help with this talk and also my fab colleagues at UCL. Thank you.